Hello, and welcome to another episode of LGO TV Big Talk. And why Big Talk? Because I hate small talk. Now, I am so delighted today to have my guest, John Jantz. John is a friend that I have come to know through the speaking world, the writing world, the podcasting world. And he is someone who is so smart and so thoughtful about the things he does. He only has big talk conversations. Uh, he is a marketing consultant, a speaker, and the author of the very popular book, Duct Tape, Duct, Duct Tape Marketing, Duct Tape Selling, The Commitment Engine, SEO for Growth, The Referral Engine, and he's the founder of the Duct Tape Marketing Consultant Network. He also has a podcast of the same name. It is one of the top marketing podcasts in the world. So, you know, he knows how to have some good conversations. So I'm looking forward to our conversation today. His latest book, The Self-Reliant Entrepreneur, is 366 Daily Meditations to Feed Your Soul and Grow Your Business. It's a daily reminder to entrepreneurs just like me, just like you, that there is a better you who can make a better business. So we're going to talk today about that because as you know, I'm doing this show, this live show, this podcast as a way to do book research for my next book, Wonder Hell, all about those moments in that journey when you're like, uh, I was told this was going to be fun. I thought this was supposed to be fun. Why isn't this fun? How do we, as entrepreneurs, how do we, as humans, make a better version of us so that we can have better businesses? So, John, I want to start by asking you, when did you know you were an entrepreneur? Huh. So I started uh, my own business uh, coming up on 30 years uh, ago, and I, I probably knew I was an entrepreneur in my teens, frankly. Uh, my dad had a very non-traditional job for those days. Uh, he was an independent sales rep, didn't have a boss that I ever met anyway, <laughs> didn't go to an office, uh, just you know, got in the car and, and you know, would leave on Sunday or Monday and come home on Thursday and, and uh, you know, seemed to have his own hours, seemed to you know, be able to do what he wanted. And I, I just think he instilled that um, in, in me, certainly, and probably in my entire uh, sibling group. I, I have seven brothers and two sisters. So, you know, it, it any you know big families sort of have an entrepreneurial <laughs> bent to them no matter what because there's like you know everybody's got to pitch in everybody's got to figure out their own thing i paid my way through college and high school you know because that was necessary so i i think the seeds were planted then where where in the birth order did you come i uh, there are six above me three below me okay so you were not quite smack in the middle but you were pretty close so you kind of you were in the fend for yourself sort of area you weren't the sort of golden child at the top and you weren't the baby that everyone took care of you you, you had to you had to be self-reliant and entrepreneurial in order to actually you know get some food yeah there's a um a story you know how family stories uh there's probably a little truth to them they become myth uh become legend <laughs> there, there is a so-called story uh in my family that uh, still gets told at holidays uh, back when people used to get together for those things and uh, um that that the uh, like three times a year my parents would take us all somewhere uh because that you know was you couldn't do that with that many people and uh, i remember one time we went to a grocery store all together and um the 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 tale goes that uh, my mom would say you know bob my dad's uh you watch uh john i'll watch the rest um because <laughs> i had insatiable curiosity and so i was the wanderer i was the one that they would find you know talking to the butcher about like why he's doing what he's doing and so i you know i think in big families people just sort of carve out their role i think that's hilarious my my husband and i have two children and we always said that we only wanted to have two children because once you lost man on man defense yeah, you were pretty yeah. much screwed like zone defense was not going to work for us but <laughs> it sounds like you had man on man defense just for you yeah that's <laughs> right. every, your, your mom took care of everyone else i love that i love that so so did did this insatiable curiosity lead you to want to pick a different career path than what people expected of you um, you know, this is, I've just started telling this story, frankly, in this way. Um, I think what, if you want to know the honest truth, what led me to my yes. entrepreneurial career path is low self-esteem. Um, I did not, I, I didn't do that well in school, not in the traditional sense. I heard um, Dan Pink say this, and I stole this line from him that, that, um, I was in the part of the, um, my graduating class that made the upper 90% possible. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> and I, you know, school for, for people that are really curious, um, school is sometimes not the right format. <laughs> um, so mm -hmm. I didn't do that great in school. I got through college, uh, but not to where I was going to go out and find this, you know, important job that I saw my friends finding. Um, and so I, I think in a lot of ways, when I decided to do my own thing, it was because I felt like that's all that was available uh, to me. And, um, you know, and, and I would never change a thing about it <laughs> in, in hindsight. Uh, but I think that, um, in a way, I was solving uh, a problem for me by hiding out, I suppose, in in doing my own thing. Yeah, that's so interesting. You know, I um, uh, our mutual friend Scott Stratton likes to say that entrepreneur is Latin for bad employee. And <laughs> there, there were there were years years after I founded my own firm, I ran into an old boss of mine, and uh, and 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 I remember we were we were standing in a in a Xerox or a, like a Kinko's FedEx. I'll tell you how long ago it was. And he came up to me and he was like, you know, he's like, I've been watching you. I've been I, I it's been so great to see you thriving as an entrepreneur. It's been so great. And he was always an entrepreneur, and he was like. Did you always know you were an entrepreneur? And I was like, no, I did completely an accident. I had no idea. And he said, well, I I always did. And I remember walking out of there feeling so flattered, like this entrepreneur. I always thought I was an entrepreneur. And then I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I think he just called me unmanageable. <laughs> hmm. yeah, yeah, I, I've... Um, I've seen, you know, uh, numerous uh, Brian Clark uh, uh, copy blogger uh, fame has started a project that uh, he calls unemployable and, and really just kind of interviews people with with that mindset. Yeah, I think that um, I think it is a very specific mindset that people have, and and we, but but at the same time, we're living in a world right now that really. Um, kind of fetishizes the whole entrepreneurship thing. Like everyone thinks they're going to make their next Facebook in, in, yeah. in their dorm room and, and the next, you know, uh, Apple in their garage. Mm -hmm. So there is also this idea that if you strike out on your own as an entrepreneur, that's awesome, right? Like you get to like go to Burning Man and, you know, biohack and do all sorts of stuff. And it's not really necessarily the reality of it. No. And I, and, and, Sometimes this is a sad truth. This is a, I mean, I would certainly, you know, there's far more risk in staying in a cubicle, you know, than, than, than you know, ever doing uh, striking out on your own. I think that's a real myth that needs to, needs to be addressed frequently. But a lot of people who call themselves entrepreneurs, you know, create, create jobs for themselves. And uh, they, you know, they do things that uh, allow them to pay the bills. But in some ways, they say they, they stay trapped in a you know, mentality now where they're, they're now they're working for, you know, complete lunatic, you know, instead of having a, a, a boss. And so I, I think there, we also need to talk about what this word entrepreneur actually means, because it's different than being a business owner. It's different than us just striking out on your own. Um, I think it's a, it's a mentality of what you're creating, the impact you want to leave, uh, how you view the work that you actually do and don't do, um, how you empower others <laughs> to, to do work. I think that, that you know, the, the extreme example is, is the person starting a business in their garage with the whole intent of selling it to Facebook. Um, you know, that's the, the whole mentality in that is get it to a certain point, you know, get, get recurring revenue to a certain point, you know, uh, get a series, whatever investment and sell this puppy. Uh, but, but I think that there's an in-between um, ground. And I think that's the, the person that's creating something because they, they have an ultimate impact that they're trying to, uh, to leave on the world. That's such a good distinction. I, I've, I've done uh, a, a number of advisory role type things with startups. And there's always that question in the beginning of, you know, like they're, they're approaching investors and, you know, you go for angel investing and that angel investor, if, if you can build a business to X and they can get 10 X from it, they don't care if you could build it to a hundred X, they want to get their money back and they want to get it back quickly. Yeah. And, you know, I've always, I've had to have those conversations with founders, like, well, what do you want this business to do? Do you want to make money from it? Do you want to build a, an institution from it? Or do you want to build a cathedral from it? Like, what are the, what, what are your actual goals? And I think a lot of entrepreneurs get, they get caught up in the cycle of bigger, better, faster, more, go in, sell quick, that type of thing, that that's success. You know, how many exits did you have when that might not be what's necessarily right. But I love your distinction between entrepreneur and business owner. And and I wonder if there's if you could talk a little bit about 
the difference of the mindset between those two individuals? Well, I think it really boils down to, um, and, I, and I've you know said this numerous times, I probably stole it from somebody like, you know, we, we do. Uh, when, when you're out there, you know, you, you start becoming uh, unconsciously uh, competent and uh, think that you invented everything. Um, but, uh, um, you know, to me, a, a business owner looks at all the work and says, how am I going to get this all done? Um, and an entrepreneur looks at the work and says, how am I going to get somebody else to do all this? That, that's the key mindset shift. <laughs> oh, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. I, 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 I mean, it's, I'm thinking about my own journey and I think I, I became an entrepreneur because I was in a traditional firm that was doing traditional work. And I had that moment of rage where I was like, this could be done better, faster, smarter, with more authenticity, more integrity, more profit, more flexibility than they're doing it. And I walked into my boss's office and I was like, here's the new way. And he was like, there's the old door. You know, I was like, see you later. And, and, and so I, I started my own business thinking I was an entrepreneur, but in fact, I started as a business owner because I did spend all of my time doing all of the things. I was doing the marketing and the delivery and the invoices and the everything, right? I was building my own website and it was horrible, but I was doing everything. And then there was a moment, I think, where I shifted to becoming an entrepreneur. And that was actually the dangerous moment because when I made the shift to becoming an entrepreneur, that was the moment when I became really interested in the innovation. How do we keep adding and changing and building and shifting and answering the problems that the clients have before they even realize that they have those problems? And then we built the company to such a size that I wanted to keep growing and innovating and changing. The market had caught up with us and we had spawned a lot of competitors. Hmm. So all of a sudden we had loads of uh, potential clients coming to us and already being bought into the way that we were doing the work, which was different because they'd gotten that pitch from six other people. And I wanted to keep changing and growing. And my people who had come to me because they loved doing the work were geeked out about the work. And they were just like, can you stop innovating? And can we just take this car on the road and see how fast we can drive it? But I was like building the Homer mobile where I was like, I got to keep adding different things to it. And that was the beginning of the divorce. Like the better I got at my work, I had to be 18 to 24 months ahead of the market. And the better they got at their work, they had to be doing the work of the clients today. And I think that's where I shifted from being the business owner to the entrepreneur. And then it, I, I didn't want to run the business anymore. Like I was done. I was like, I need an exit plan. I got to get out of here because this is it's bad for me to be here and it's bad for you to have a leader like me. So that's a it's an it's an interesting and and there's like a an, another side to that, which is like the sort of dark side is that entrepreneurs can't run businesses and businesses can't be entrepreneurs, maybe. I think that's Maybe not. A, no, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I wouldn't say can't be. They have to adjust for. Yes. Um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of very successful firms have a role that they call an implementer. Um, and so that 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 person is the shield <laughs> between yeah. the the entrepreneur and, and the rest of the group and and is is the translator and is the no, we're not going to work on that. Yes. Um, you know, this yeah. this month. And I think that that um, you know, most most entrepreneur entrepreneurs need that balanced person, um, you know, whatever he or she is that that kind of balances out you know, what they are um, you know, good at because I, or, and then obviously where their blind spots are. I mean, I'm, I'm very typical in that. I, you know, I like to create and change and, and, you know, move to the next thing and, you know, feel I almost have to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but that, you know, that's, that's not always good for business. Um, and it's uh, um, certainly, as you noted, it's not always good for the, the people that came there for the original story. Yes, in, indeed. In fact, five years into the work, I realized that I was a really bad manager, like a bad, horrible, abusive manager. Like I'm a great champion. I am the fox. I'm, 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 I'm the friend in your foxhole. I am the one you want in your corner in a bar fight. I will shine the light on my people, but helping them every day to increase their quality. Ugh, I just, it was not my thing. So I brought somebody on as a business partner who became the COO and the one who basically became the buffer and the implementer. And eventually when I sold the firm, I sold it to her and another woman who helped run it because they were really like, they were the implementers, they were the workers. So in your journey, did you, did you start off as an entrepreneur? Or did you start off as a business owner? Oh, I started off as a hustler. You know, That's a hustler. I mean, okay. I mean, I. It's a whole other category we got now. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I had no plan. And aren't all entrepreneurs and business owners well, hustlers? Don't you have to be in either category? I, I, certainly, because you know, you're, you're, 
you know, you're going out to people lying to them. <laughs> I like to say that I was the Wizard of Oz. I was like, I like people are like, how did you do it? What was your business plan? I'm like, I didn't have a business plan. I had business. I had a couple potential clients and I told them I was doing it. I didn't have a plan. That came yeah. years later. So, okay. So you were a hustler and you yeah, had I no mean, plan. I knew I could get work. And, and so, I mean, I'm not even sure I had, in fact, I know I had no vision for you know, <laughs> what I was uh, trying to do. It was just like, oh, you'll pay me to do that. I'll figure it out. Exactly. Um, and, and, uh, you know, that, that, you just wrote my business plan, actually. <laughs> Quite <laughs> for frankly, my entire life, every business I've ever started. <laughs> it, that lasted for about five years, um, and I actually built the business pretty quickly, not knowing what I was doing. Um, but I also got a grand jury uh, subpoena um, out of that uh, uh, approach. So we'll tell that story later. Okay. Yeah, we want to get back to that story. I'm just kidding. I'll tell you right now if you want to know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It, That's it, big it. talk, John. That's big <laughs> talk. Let's talk about your time in prison. No, let's talk about your grand jury subpoena. Well, so um, as I said, I built uh, the thing, you know, just hustling, just anybody said they'd pay me. One of my clients um, was uh, indicted on uh, federal racketeering uh, charges. And so they went through uh, who that person might have been working with. Uh, I showed up and uh, so I got an invitation to this uh, really crappy room with really crappy chairs and very bright lights. <laughs> I bet the coffee was pretty crappy too. <laughs> well, all I know is it was served in 12 ounce styrofoam cups, yeah. I don't, you know, but I don't remember anything else. <laughs> yeah. So they followed the money. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, fortunately I had nothing to tell them that was interesting and I went on my way, but you know, I tell myself, uh, certainly uh, years later that um, while I was not doing anything illegal, was I pretty sure they were? <laughs> and yet, um, you know, I was working with them and uh, yeah. it was definitely a, a time, a moment, you know, some people talk about these pivot, pivotal, you know, things that happen. Uh, fortunately, I didn't have so many time in jail because of it, but I certainly learned my lesson that I was not, um, I was not going to work with anyone who um, that, that, you know, I didn't get to choose, so to speak. Mm. That I didn't, you know, share values with that, uh, um, that didn't, you know, that, that I wasn't able to, I don't want to say dictate, but, but at least, you know, share with them, you know, here's how we're going to work together. Um, and, uh, and so really, you know, from that moment on, I, I mean, changed everything about who I targeted, who I went to work with, what I, um, what I developed as my ultimate kind of life's work. So that's an, that's a really interesting moment, you know, I, I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, the firing of clients is terrifying yeah. because yeah. you're like, I don't know if the phone's going to ring again. Right. <laughs> and yet the phone always rings again, right? Like there's always a time the phone rings again. Good work begets more good work. That's just, it's like if, if you're, if you are doing service, something in the professional services world and you're not getting word of mouth, you're probably not doing a very good job. So, yeah. you yeah. know, I think, I think that, that the phone should keep ringing and yet it's really terrifying when it does. And I remember there were always those moments for the first five years, I had no idea when the sales were coming. And then one day I sat down and I, I, because somebody told me to do this, this wasn't my idea. I wasn't that smart, but somebody told me to just look back on the last five years of contracts and figure out when they were signed. And I was like, well, wouldn't you know all of our contracts, like 90% of our contracts get signed in January, April, July, and November interesting so now when like it's june and the contracts are ending and we don't have anything new i know that july is coming around right it's going to be okay but it took me years to figure that out and the, i think the i think the decisions that you make in panic mode mm. am i going to get another client is this person going to come i don't really know if i completely agree with this person's ethics but i need the cash flow there are those moments so as an i mean as an entrepreneur how do you keep yourself calm yeah. and just sort of stick to the ethics, the morals that yeah. you have now put in place for yourself. Well, some of it's just experience and learning and getting back up again, you know, and saying, Oh, okay, well, you know, that didn't work. Um, but uh, um, I, I also, you know, and a couple of things I've learned, you know, fr from that kind of mindset is that um, a, uh, there's nothing sexier than not needing work. Yes, <laughs> you know, to to a, a, a potential buyer. Um, and the the other thing that I think you learn with experience is that if something doesn't happen that you wanted to or expected, it to, to me, it's probably a good sign that something else is supposed to happen. Um, I, I I give one example without naming names. I had a um, early on in my career a you know big name tech firm 
um, wanted me to, you know, do some spokesperson work, uh, do some writing for them, kind of be, you know, be in some of their ads and things. And, and it was, um, it was a nice gig. Um, you know, especially early on, I was, you know, so thrilled that, that I got that kind of attention and, um, it didn't happen. And I was just, you know, I was devastated because it was going to be nice money. It was going to be great exposure. Um, and literally like two weeks later, another high tech uh, firm came with, I mean, a ridiculous thing that they wanted me to do for them. And the only question they asked me is now you haven't done any work for X, have you? Um, and, uh, you know, I was able to say, no, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> and I never will. <laughs> Thank you very a, much. In their mind, it was a deal killer. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's a, a pretty sort of uh, tangible example of, of, you know, kind of realizing the universe, you know, probably has a plan um, and that it, it, it's uh, our stressing over what we want to happen or what, you know, should have happened or what didn't happen. Um, it's going to rob us of, of seeing the next opportunity that's supposed to happen. I think perspective is such a difficult thing when you're in the entrepreneurial sure. cycle. It's so hard. And I, I, you know, I used to tell my team all the time, like, <clears throat> I know it's June and things are quiet and your searches are ending. Trust me, there'll be more in July. Take a couple of weeks off. Don't yeah. worry about it. You're going to get paid. And they were like, no, 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 I need more work. I need more. I was like, trust me. Yeah. And years and it would be, you know, people would work for me for three, four five years. And then finally it'd be like, okay, I get it. I believe you now. I understand. But it, it, it takes a long time to build that kind of perspective and then even longer to have trust in your own perspective then even longer to be able to communicate that to other people. So I think we get in this cycle of, you know, stress and anxiety and every, you know, we, we think we're only as good as the last project. And, yeah. you know, if something goes wrong, we're ruined. And if the phone doesn't ring tomorrow, that's the new normal and it's never going to ring again. So you've been at this game for a while. How did you get, like, where, when did you start getting that perspective? Um, I, you know, I still, um, I think for a long time, you know, suffered from that idea of, of, you know, ups and downs and, and really one of the curses of, of my business in some cases has been that I want to chase something new. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, anybody who's, you know, I'm, I'm actually releasing my seventh book. Um, those books are great if I didn't have a day job. Um, and so, you know, chasing that thing, because I get a lot out of, you know, putting that book out of there sometimes is hard on the business. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, you know, I don't, um, I, I really think that I've come to uh, perspective probably with, with age and I, I hate to make myself sound so old, but uh, you know, I, I do think that um, uh, I, I'm, um, I'm never satisfied. I'm never done. I mean, I'm not a perfectionist by any means, but I just know things can be, um, can be, can evolve, can be better, can change. Um, so I'm constantly doing that when, and, and sometimes, um, you know, not looking back and saying, look how freaking far we've come. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and again, it's, I'm never going to fall into the hustle and grind camp. That's not it at all. Yeah. Uh, I just feel like more could be done. I feel like more people could be saved. <laughs> that yes. whole time. So, um, yes. so that sometimes probably robs me of a little bit of the, the joy and the, the impact. I mean, one of the greatest moments, and I'm sure you have received uh, these with your great work, but when, when somebody, you know, can honestly point to, I mean, I've had some, because I wrote Duct Tape Marketing in 2006, I've had some really successful people reach out to me and say, I read your book when I was just getting started and now I've got this empire. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, well, I'd like to take all the credit for that. Exactly. Um, you obviously had to act, but <laughs> it, it's extremely um, um, gratifying to, to realize that, that that's, you know, that's lifetime impact um, for a bunch of people. I mean, the, the one I'm thinking of has, you know, a couple hundred employees uh, started yeah. out from scratch and, and, you know, and I know uh, for a fact, because not only did he buy my book, I had a course, you know, in 2006 or seven. And, and I, I know he was one of the first buyers of that too. And then, you know, turns around and it's got a hundred million dollar business. So um, that kind of yeah. impact is, uh, is, is what we ought to take, you know, home. And I think a lot of, you know, we, because we put stuff out publicly, we get sometimes that validation. Um, but I think, um, you know, I, I think if you impact one person, 10 people, you know, 30 people, um, that is a lifetime of success. And mm -hmm. 
I think too few people um, really give themselves that gift. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. I think a lot of people, a lot of people read the comments, but they only focus on the, you know, I mean, when Limitless came out, I, I got, you know, hundreds of four and five star reviews, but I got one one star review. And I can tell you word for word what that one star review says. Do I know the person who left it? No. Yeah. Would I recognize them in a crowd of one? No. Did I still take what they said exceptionally personally and made it definitional to my ego? Yes. Right. Yeah. Like I think that's just, I think that's just par for the course, but it is, um, but, but look, I, 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 I love what you what you put in your last book in the self reliant entrepreneur three hundred and sixty six daily meditations to feed your soul and grow your business because it really does take that perspective and and put it into something that's tangible. I mean, what I love about the book is you took all of these writings from you know all across history, all different types of genres, and you separated the year into seasons because that's really what it's like, right? And depending yeah. on what business you run, your winter may be different than someone else's spring. But we we do go through these seasons as entrepreneurs. And and it's not, you know, it's not, a, a, you know, a marathon. Um, it, it is, or sorry, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And so sort of keeping that, that energy long term and keeping that perspective and understanding what fuels you, how, how you need to fuel your clients, how you need to, to, to fuel your family, how you, you know, how it all works together in this ecosystem, I think is a really beautiful thing to do. And I, when, when, when it came out, I bought it, I put it on my desk and I started like flipping through it every day and reading it. And it was almost like that you know, I'm not a meditator. I'm not a yoga person. I'm not a, like, I'm not a religious person. And, but it was like, it was like my moment of Zen every day to just sort of sit. And I, I found myself throughout the day and throughout the coming days, continuing to in conversation, refer back to, well, you know, it's like, I just, you know, it's, 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 it's like, it's like Thoreau said, and by the way, I read that in this great book and you should check it out. And, you know, it was just really funny. It just, it stuck with me and it gave me this grounding space that I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't have because it's really lonely in that space when you're the one who's got to like keep all the lights on and throw all the, you know, have the pans all in the air and do all the things. So it's, it was it, but it's different than other books that you've written. Yeah, very much. I mean, uh, it, it, all my other books have been squarely in marketing, some how to, I mean, this is uh, I call this my why to <laughs> a book as opposed to how to book. And it, it really kind of mirrors. Um, I am one of those meditators and, <laughs> and yoga people. And um, I have, you know, pretty, um, um, Eastern sort of uh, spiritual beliefs uh, that I, you know, kind of bring to my day, um, and and journaling and and reading um, inspirational uh, literature has always been part of my morning ritual uh, after the kids grew up. Uh, but uh, I mean, uh, I love that you wrote this book because it became part of my morning ritual. Yeah. I didn't I didn't know I needed it until it landed on my desk, and now it's like okay, I'm just going to keep like every year. I'm just going to keep rereading it. It's 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 such a gift. Well, and, and again, it was, it, it, you know, it's really just the ramblings of a madman, you know, at times. I mean, I think because it, 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 it truly was just me trying to say, well, here's what I think about these things. And uh, in the context of entrepreneurship um, and, and in the context of my journey, um, I wasn't trying to preach. I mean, the, the ironic thing about, you know, you can't tell somebody how to be self-reliant, the self parts on you. Um, so I really was just sharing and it, it's been very gratifying to, to hear other people say, gosh, that's that was so relevant today. That's exactly what I'm struggling with today. And and I think it's really just a sort of a happy accident that, that those ideas run into each other. Yeah, I think it's I think it's terrific. It's you can actually see it. It's right there in the back. A little, little okay. orange book there, right there. There it is <laughs> on, on my bookshelf right behind my desk. So I, I look at it every day. Um, so so, you know, as you know, I'm doing I'm doing this, uh, these interviews as research for the upcoming book, um, which I'll just uh say quickly, just so people who are listening to it for the, for the first time will hear it. It's about this moment when the thing that you are, have created, the business that you're, you're building, the the, pro the product that you're uh, putting out, the, the book that you've written, it, somebody picks it up and they spend five minutes looking at it. And it's so incredibly and amazing and humbling and wonderful. And at the same time, you've also never been so tired in your entire life. You're full of anxiety. You're full of stress. You're exhausted. You're like, it's Doubtville. It's imposter town, burnout city. <laughs> it's hell. It's wonderful. And it's hell. It's wonder hell. <clears throat> and wonder hell is that space in your psyche where your burden of potential comes in and unpacks its backpack and is like, hey, John, 
I just showed you the new you that you didn't know you could be. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to let this person pass you by? Or are you going to live into this newfound you? And every book that I've seen that's out there is all about how you can like survive it and muscle through it and hustle and grind and all that stuff that you and I both can't stand. But there are not a lot of books about how to embrace it and love it and thrive in it and find yourself in it and push your boundaries and figure out what you're made of. Because on the other side of Wonder Hell is the next level of success. And with that next level comes the next wonder hell. And so I wonder if in hearing that, if that resonates with you and you're like, yeah, I've had that those moments when all of a sudden I'm like, you know what? I only thought I could get to here, but now that I'm here, I see the vista that's out there and I want to get to there. And then you get to that place and it's like, oh, but I want more, right? It's <laughs> not ambition, but just a self of a sense of ego and a, and a, a need to fulfill that, that, that burden that you feel, that burden of potential that's on you. So I think I, I think some of that is driven by what we see other people doing. And we're just like, well, I guess that's how it's done. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we read the book that says how somebody named Gary did it. And um, and we think, well, that's how it's done. <laughs> that, that's the roadmap. Yeah, you but, know, I wrote a whole book about how I hate that idea. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that part of it is, you know, we, we, we fail to recognize that, that that worked for them. That's their yes. path. That's because that's who they are, yes. um, it's not who you are. And so it'll never work for you. Uh, there is a great book um, by Rene Dumont. It's uh, uh, just recently, probably in the last 10 years, been translated um, in, into English. Um, and I'm totally spacing the title. But uh, what I wanted to grab was, was a quote that just blew me away. It's uh, the, the books, uh, the entire metaphor is, is about mountains and um, what this group of people are doing uh, to try to climb this mountain that supposedly um, touches heaven. Mm. Um, and so uh, the, the quote is when they when they start climbing um, and just a, it was just like a casual conversation. Um, the one the leader says, you know, there are plenty of people that want you to get to the mountaintop. that will tell you how to get to the mountaintop. What I need is somebody to tell me how to get back down. Yes. Um, and it just, that just floored me because I was like, yes, that's exactly it. You know, down in the valley is really <laughs> where I lived is yes. really where I thrive, but I've been focused on this, you know, the climb, how do I get back to myself in a lot of ways? Because I think the real paradox of this is that, you know, people who experience a tremendous amount of success, particularly entrepreneurs, um, they experience it by doing something that, that gets them there. And the moment they get there, not always, but in a lot of cases, they have to choose. Can I still do that where I am now? Um, or do I have to actually, does my role change? Now, in some cases, I think it just has to. You know, you can't be the, the same CEO of a three-person company that, uh, as a you know, 300 person company. I mean, you, your role, you either have to change or get out you know, because, you know, you can't do the same thing. But I think sometimes what happens is that the thing that creates success, we leave behind. I, I, I'll give you a tangible example from me. Um, I wrote 300, uh, I'm sorry, 3,217 blog posts in a row every day for about eight years. Um, it is without a doubt um, a giant factor in whatever success I've experienced. Um, I write, um, I, I mean, the world has changed and how people consume content has changed, but I, you know, I'm lucky if I write one a week, um, <laughs> you know, these, uh, these days, because my, my role changed in a way that didn't really allow me to have even the headspace you know, for writing uh, every single day, something that I was going to publish out to the world and call, you know, at least good work, if not my best work. Um, and I think that um, that it's really easy to get away from that. You start going to conferences and people go, oh, I love your work. I love what you do. And you start thinking, I got this figured out, you know. Right. And to me, um, in some ways, um, I, I, I feel um, I feel for uh, many of the folks whose entire livelihood has been wiped out in very, very many ways, but certainly in our circles, you know, speakers. Mm -hmm. um, but in a way, this year of not speaking <laughs> has been, um, or not going, you know, to speak and not going to be put on, let's face it, the pedestal that you sometimes are put on doing that has been very healthy for me. 
Um, and um, in terms of kind of getting closer to my the real impact I want to have, uh, it certainly colored my writing uh, for my next book. And um, I, I think it's um, I think it's a lesson, you know, for all, for a lot of entrepreneurs that um, that you do have to you do have to remember not remember how you got here, like remember the people that you know helped you get here, but but literally remember, you know, the gift that that you bring, um, and don't ever let go of that. Don't ever, you know, realize that I'm so big I can, you know, I can delegate me. Well, so so I want to I want to spend a little time in that because I think a lot of entrepreneurs and even business owners get into the work because they love the work. Yeah, right. They love the thing, and then the next thing you know, you're running a company and you're not doing the thing anymore, and you have to be running the company. And in my case, it turned out that I was bored of the thing and I loved running the company and that was pretty cool. But in a lot of cases, it, a lot of entrepreneurs can't get their fingers out of the thing. They want to keep doing the thing or they um, they don't trust that other people can do it. They, you know, they, they can't yeah. let go and they find themselves doing both at the same time, which is clearly an untenable thing. But yeah. you went from writing, what did you say? 3,217 blog posts to, to, to writing maybe one a week, but you're still producing yeah. all of these books. So you're still writing. Yeah. So you, you found a way it seems like to keep the thing that you love doing, but just put it into a different form that works well for you, for what your business needs now. Yeah, I, I, I think that's very true. Um, I, I think that the um, I think that it is a real challenge, as you said, for entrepreneurs that, that love doing. It. I'm um, I'm somewhat introverted, and uh, all I mean by that really is that uh, I can get up in front of an audience and go whatever they need to hear and be whoever they need to be, you know, for thirty minutes. But then I go back to my room and I, you know, I just want to stare at something um, to to sort of recharge. And I mean, I would spend I would spend a lot of time you know, fixing websites and doing stuff because I just like it, <laughs> you know. But it it certainly doesn't um, it doesn't, uh, um, it doesn't allow me to do, it doesn't allow me to have the impact that I want to have, um, by uh, a certain level of growth. But I think one of the things that entrepreneurs need to do is they need to, they, I, I think it's that piece. What's the impact you want to have? Okay. What's the choice? What are the choices then that you have to make? Because it's okay. I mean, I do think a lot of times we really do get all bent up in this. Oh, so-and-so said on Facebook, they just did blah, blah, blah. I need to do that. Well, Think, step back for a minute. Are you okay with having the business the way it is now? You know, are you okay with it providing, you know, what you need it to provide? I mean, I think that's the first part that people have to you know, come to terms with. And if they're not, if they want it to be something else, okay, then do something uh, about that. But don't just feel like I have to, you know, I can't do this work anymore because, um, you know, if I'm going to grow a company, I have to be a CEO hire a CEO, you know, if, if that's what it takes. I, one of my daughters, um, has started a company and I, I, I will, uh, obviously I'm a, you know, doting father, you know, uh, coming off saying this, but she has, uh, she has built a business so much better than me, um, in, in terms of, uh, doing it, uh, the way that, you know, she, you know, I, I was totally guilty of knowing how to do everything and then doing it all and then, you know, figuring out how to, you know, get other people to do it. But she, you know, she's from the get go, hired before she could, um, you know, got brought in coaches, brought in consultants to say, OK, how do we set up people ops? And, you know, I'm just blown away because I, you know, quite frankly, I've been in business 30 years and I haven't done any of that stuff. But, um, you know, that's that's the path that she wants to take. And it's and it's proving to be, um, you know, one that that really serves uh, her goals. So. You know, I think that's, you know, that uh, I'm, I'm rambling. So let me wrap this back up again <laughs> that uh, um, be OK with, you know, where you are, if that's where you know you that's what really makes you happy. If you want to have bigger impact or play bigger, uh, then figure out, you know, what, you know, who needs to come with you. Yeah, I'm listening to the story of your daughter and I'm thinking, God, what must that be like to actually be smart and strategic about the way you're building a business. But I, I thought that as you were saying that she was building it so well, I was like, yeah, but she just has the benefit of having technology and the internet and things like we didn't have. No, she actually has strategy. <laughs> she, yeah. See, she had a plan. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't have a plan. She has a plan. So when, when I ran my business, I used to say that we could either maximize profit, maximize impact, or maximize personal freedom and flexibility. And I used to say that we could actually even pick any two of the three 
but all three was you can't you can't maximize on all three at the same time and you have to make decisions and every time we got away from our grounding principles which were impact and personal freedom and looked at maximizing mm-hmm. profit we made wrong decisions we brought on yeah. the wrong clients we did the wrong work we hired the wrong staff even in the sale of the company to my people I I got my ego all in a bunch because I was like, what do you mean? They don't think I'm worth X. And and I tried to sell it based on profit. And then when my husband, who is much smarter than I am, turned around and said, Laura, you've never run the company to maximize profit. You've run it to maximize impact and personal freedom. Why don't you sell it for that? And then I was like, oh. And then we had a conversation, me and my business partner around that. And suddenly it was like, we came to a great decision that worked for everybody. And it turns out I actually ended up making more money in the end. Like I ended up maximizing the profit because we made the decision based on impact and personal freedom and flexibility. But I think your point about going into the work, understanding what you want to get out of the work. And also that that may change over time, right? Like when you start, if I started my business when my, when my, my eldest was six weeks old, now he's about to go off to college, right? So like you change also what you need in your life changes. And again, this brings us back to seasons, right? There's seasons of the year, there's seasons of entrepreneurship, there's seasons of your life, but understanding what you want to get out of it really makes the decisions of what you put into it and the decisions and, and, and the strategy much easier. So were there times where you found yourself where you were like, yeah, that's, that was the wrong decision. I shouldn't be doing that. And you realize that, you know, you, you, you backed into taking on a client you shouldn't have, or doing a project or starting a book or was where, where did it go wrong? Um, I, at, um, at one point, this has probably only been about eight years ago. <clears throat> I have um, a, a number of different businesses that kind of fall under the duct tape umbrella. And uh, one of them is a consultant network of folks that license our methodology and um, and do you know independent marketing uh, consulting all over the world. And uh, th- there was a point where that was the uh, speaking, writing stuff that I was doing was was really taking up my time. And uh, I wasn't I didn't feel like I was giving enough to you know the building of that other organization but I, yet i was still you know pretty much in charge mm-hmm. um, and so i tried to uh, bring in a couple of partners um but um you know you know the old hindsight um lesson um <laughs> there were a lot of things that i did wrong um, i'm not going to blame anybody there was a lot of things i did wrong um in in setting it up in you know organizing it running it and structuring the deal um so uh fortunately i was in a position to take it all back, <laughs> do over. Um, but it, you know, it cost five years of, you know, of what that organization probably uh, could be. Um, we're in great, great shape now, but you know, it was a couple rough years. Did you, the, the, the partnership, did you bring in the wrong people? Did you partner with someone you should have employed? Was it, did yeah. you just have different outlooks on what success yeah. meant? What, what was, what happened? Yeah, I think it was a probably a combination of some of those things. They ultimately were not the right people. Um, but uh, but to take some of the blame off of that, um, the the organization was still too dependent on me. So all of a sudden, it, I had given up two thirds of the business, and yet it still really counted on me showing up, um, you know, to make it go. And so you know, it just it it was my mistake, but it didn't make for a very good deal. Yeah, gosh, you know, I think I think every I think every entrepreneur has made that decision where you're like, what was I thinking? Right? Like it's so yeah. it's and and you know, and usually it usually happens as you're regaling the story at some point over drinks, you know, at some conference and you tell the story in hindsight and people are like, duh, right? Cuz of course it seems so clear when you tell the story later. Um but I want I would just to give one last point on that. Yeah. I think the real lesson in it for me was that the if you're going to sell anything, it can't depend on you. Yes. <laughs> you know, to, to continue. And that to me was was um, the the real lesson. And it's and so the the upside, you know, learning to come out of that is now, you know, I've structured pretty much everything that I do um, much differently. Oh, so that's really interesting. Yeah, because you know, this is what I was mentioning earlier. Like, are you building a cathedral? Are you building an institution? Those are two very different businesses that you build. I I intentionally never put my name on anything that I created yeah. because it's then you're you're basically creating a cage. I mean, that's yeah. you're you're building a cathedral, but it's a cage, and that's that's really that's really tough. But um, when you're in that moment and you figure out it was the wrong decision, these were the wrong partners. What 
how, how did how did that feel in your mind, in your body, in your heart, in your family? <laughs> like, what? Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, I'm going to take us back to second grade. Okay. Um, no, I mean it, it. It it like a lot of things. You know, you feel rage and frustration and uh, avoidance. That's my real go-to mm. yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> is, uh, um, you know, went on 18 months longer than it should have, you know, kind of thing, because um, one of the things you learn growing up in a big family is, uh, you know, you, you become a pleaser. Like, how do I get attention? Yes. <laughs> you know? yes. And uh, you don't, we are you, going back to second grade. <laughs> you, you avoid confrontation, you know, at, uh, at all costs. Um, and uh, um, so I think when you're really in it, all, all it looks like is shit. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, um, you know, these le that's why I said, you know, the lessons come in hindsight. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I guarantee you in 2014, I wasn't able to say it was really my fault. Yeah. <laughs> but um, in, in hindsight, you know, I was the problem. Yeah, I, I, I think pretty much every major mistake that's occurred in my lifetime in hindsight, I can say I was the problem. I've either it was I was the problem and I caused it or I was the problem because I didn't grok it soon enough and I exacerbated it or yeah. I let my emotions get in the way or my ego or whatever, whatever it is. I mean, even even COVID, even even COVID, I I, I blamed COVID for months about mm. ruining my business, my speaking yeah. business. It's COVID's yeah. fault. It's the politician's fault. It's the it's the spring breakers fault. It's everybody else's fault. And I was like, actually, it's my fault. I'm the problem. Like I'm the one who wasn't creative enough about thinking that this could be a way to do things. And I only thought that it had to be the stage and the, you know, and not the screen because it had always been the stage. And so it, that, that's a, you know, it's sort of funny. It's like this hall of mirrors moment where you're like looking in the mirror and you're like, I, the person who's looking back at me seems fine. And really what's not so fine. Right. May I make an observation? Yes. I think, I don't know you well enough to probably say this, so I'm going out on a limb a little bit, um, but I think it produced uh, an edge of rage uh, that came okay. out beautifully, frankly. Um, in in what you were expressing, it was raw, um, and I I think that was a good thing. Well, thank Especially you. now that you've bottled it. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. You know, it's, it's very funny. Our mutual friend, Mitch Joel, uh, was telling a story. We were, we, you know, this new clubhouse app, we were on clubhouse the other day and he was telling a story about how in the beginning of COVID I was going on Facebook every day, doing these lives every day. And I was talking and he was like hectoring me, like, what are you doing? That's a waste of time. That's terrible. It's awful. Like you're, what are you putting all this content out there for? You should just write it down and write it, blog it, put it in a book. And I was like, I know, but I just, I can't, I, I can't write right now. I just, I don't have it in me. Yeah. And then, and he said a few months later, he was then seeing me doing like he, he said, I saw how fast you got better on camera. Mm -hmm. He said, and I saw some of your, you know, your actual videos and your keynotes. And he said, and it was amazing. And I realized I was wrong because you were so busy emoting onto the camera, but you were getting in all the reps while I was getting rusty. And it was so interesting from someone like Mitch, who was, you know, such a legend to, yeah. to hear that. And, and it wasn't what I, again, that wasn't the plan. It just sort of happened because I was emotional and raw and putting it out there, which is nice. Cause I don't work in the marketing space. I work in the self-help and development space. That's so right. I can be as raw as I want. People love it. It's like, that's like a selling point, like vulnerability. Yeah. <laughs> may, may, may I say Mitch clubhouse isn't a waste of time. <laughs> clubhouse is fascinating. It is deeply fascinating, but it fascinating. Can, uh, certainly be a time suck. It is definitely a time suck. Okay, so you are now pivoting back in your seventh book yeah. to marketing. So you have a new book coming out in September, which I would imagine is probably available for pre-order or will be soon. Okay, the ultimate it, it, it marketing is. engine. Talk to us yeah. about it. Well, um, so I think if, before we started uh, rolling tape here, I like to say that sounds so, so nostalgic. Yeah, um, I looked you up in my Rolodex to make this appointment. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was telling you that uh, I actually signed the contract for this in March, uh, March 1st of 2020. And again, if anybody needs a reminder, about March 15th, the world went to heck. Um, and so I, I suspect a lot of people, I've talked to some other authors, uh, made it difficult to not to write necessarily as as your habit, but your thinking was so messed up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, we all had COVID brain, whether we had COVID or not. Yeah, and and so I, you know, I consciously, I mean, I, I didn't want to write how to market in a time of COVID, um, you know, as a book, um, and and so because I, I wanted it to be evergreen, but but with I wanted to also 
um, have a thread that acknowledged what I had experienced. Um, and it, it actually came, uh, the whole thread sort of came together um, when I went back and reread a text that I got from a client on March 14th at uh, 8 p.m. in the evening, uh, which I never I mean, I have some clients, we all probably have clients that have done that, but this one that never, and I've worked with them for you know over a decade. Um, and just talking about, um, I mean, it, it, he wanted me to, you know, to review his uh, planned email. Of course, he sent it in a text, but his planned email that he was going to send the next day to all of his customers and all of his employees, basically saying, don't come into work. <laughs> um, and they were a modeling contractor. All of his customers like, I'm sorry, we're stopping. <laughs> Your kitchen is going to be hell. <laughs> you know, we're stopping because it's the right thing to do. Mm. Um, and so I helped him get that prepared. And um, and I was on the chain. So I saw the replies and I was just immediately struck by the love and kindness and response from employees and clients who basically said, hey, you're doing the right thing. No matter when, we, you know, this happens, we'll be here. You know, we're not going anywhere. Um, they didn't lose a single job, single client. Um, they had a couple employees that just uh, didn't want to go back, you know, to work um, in doing that. So there are probably a few of those that, that you know, they parted ways with. But um, it, it just kind of brought home a, a fundamental truth that that sort of this shone a light on. Um, and, and that is that, you know, in, in good times, businesses a lot of times thrive just by being in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, but in really tough times, businesses uh, survive uh, and thrive in some cases come out even stronger because they uh, have a meaningful place in the hearts and homes of, of their customers. Um, and that, you know, that fundamental truth, you know, is uh, just I saw time and time again. And so uh, this book is really about um, uh, kind of the, the, the theme that I'm wrapping it around is, is, you know, how do we start looking at customers like we would at members? And I don't mean like a subscription or membership uh, program, but just that 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 instead of thinking, here's what we sell, we you know, they pay us. <laughs> we deliver, you know, everybody's happy is that, that we start looking at our customers, especially our best customers and say, look, here's where they are today. Where do they ultimately want to go? How could our business be about creating uh, transformation as opposed to transaction? Um, mm. So the steps in this book are really about, you know, finding those 20 percenters um, and, and building a complete uh, success track for them and maybe structuring your business around their whole ecosystem as opposed to um, just what it is that you sell and you go out and find more customers to sell more of that to. I love, I love that. And, and I'll tell you a, a quick story that uh, about three weeks ago, I sent out a newsletter every Tuesday morning and it's, uh, it's, it's a hello truth day, which is like mm -hmm. their meditations on things I know to be true. And I kind of write raw and from the heart about it. And there's a couple F bombs thrown in usually because that's what my heart sings. And I got an email back from somebody on uh, Tuesday afternoon saying, I just wanted to let you know that I'm unsubscribing from your newsletter list. I've been on your newsletter list for six months and mm. it was recommended to me by Gretchen Rubin, who mm. I respect deeply and I love, and she loves you. So I thought I'd love you. And I've been reading your newsletters for six months and I just have to tell you, I don't love them. And I just wanted to let you know that, you know, you introduce yourself as a kick in the ass wrapped in a warm hug. And I feel like I'm getting more of the kick in the ass and not enough of the warm hug. And so I just wanted to let you know that I'm unsubscribing and I wanted to take a minute to tell you why. And I read it and I sort of sat with it for a few hours and I wasn't quite sure what to do. And then I decided to respond to her. And I wrote back and I said, I just want to thank you for reaching out to me. And if in fact you love Gretchen Rubin, then I'm definitely not for you because she is a lot more warm hug. And I love that you found her. I also love that you're unsubscribing from my newsletter because that means that you're going to make more space in your inbox for other people who work for you. And what I didn't say, but I then wrote in a blog post later is, and I was glad she unsubscribed to my newsletter because it also means that I'm not going to spend any time trying to wrap myself into a pretzel to be right, right for her. And I can actually be right for the people who, who do like what I'm putting out there. And I hadn't thought about it in terms of really focusing down on the 20% who love you and really being there for them and hitting it out of the park for them and not worrying about the rest of the 40% on either side because they'll take care of themselves. They'll either come into the camp or they'll leave and make room for other people. But that's a really great way to think about it is how do you take your fans and turn them into like, you know, absolute loyal champions and all the people who are kind of, you know, not here or there, they'll they'll be wherever they're going to be. 
Yeah, we tend to build things for the masses, um, and that you know, then the, then it has less value for for everyone. Um, I, yeah, because I, because because it it costs more money to acquire a new customer than it does to resell to your current customers, right? So why like why do we spend so much time so busy trying to find new customers when we could just thrill our current customers, who then will go out and do the selling and find us new customers already, right? Well, and and more than that, um, I guarantee you that twenty percent of your customers want to give you ten times the amount of money that uh, that they are giving you today, yeah. if given the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, so you know, focus on that instead of uh, going out and selling another thousand dollar product to a, another person. I love um, that. I hope yeah. You listen to uh, uh, Seth uh, Seth Godin's uh, podcast, Akimbo. Um, he uh, he really talks beautifully about that. What you just said uh, that that you know it's that whole idea of you know your tribe is is who you have to take care of, and and we do spend way too much time on, you know the 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 people that just you know our truth wasn't you know right for them. <laughs> and yes. uh, um, although I I do I do have to ask you, was there just like half a second where you wanted to just write f you? And I mean, <laughs> I definitely took a screenshot of it and crossed her name off and sent it to a few friends. And I'm like, what the fuck? I mean, like, thanks for sharing that. I'm terrible. You know, there were like a couple moments, but then I sort of th sat with it and I realized that goodbye is a gift. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it was a gift, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I like that. Um, I like that she told me why, because, you know, I can see how people come to my newsletter. And I knew if I looked at her in ConvertKit, I could see that she came to me because she saw an interview that Gretchen Rubin did with me and it was on LinkedIn yeah. and it got a gazillion views. And I could see that she clicked on a certain link. So she was tagged in my system. So if I went and I saw, oh, her people don't like me, I should be more like her so that they like me more that would be different than the way she explained it to me, which was so lovely and so generous of her to yeah. do. And I could say, yeah, you know what? She's right. She's right. I'm not Gretchen. Gretchen is fantastic, but fellow, I'm not Gretchen. Fellow Kansas Cityan, by the way. Yeah. I mean, she is like Midwest nice, right? I'm not Midwest nice. I'm I'm married to a Cincinnatian. Midwest nice. I get it. There's not a lot of F-bombs in Gretchen's emails, and there's not a lot of ass kicking in Gretchen's emails, but her emails are great. I mean, her 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 happiness project book was one of the books that changed my life. So, yeah. you know, she's terrific. There's a place for everybody, but it was it, it was something in particular about the way this woman wrote the email that 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 really framed it for me as it's a you know you're just not for me and that's yeah. that's okay and I think it's so hard because I do think we try to be all things to all people and that just exhausts us yeah and and part of the the challenge of course too is that um, a, a lot of and I wouldn't even call what she said negative it just was addressing her particular hurt. Yes. And we definitely can't be in charge of that. <laughs> I mean, I was really more just like, she's read my emails for six months. Yeah. <laughs> it took her yeah. six months. Yeah. Really? Um, yeah. So, you know, that I, was. <laughs> I actually like it when people take the time, frankly. Yeah. Um, you know, I get sometimes we all get in a hurry and I don't. I've never been able to find somebody to check all my work. Um, and uh, I get the grammar police uh, every now and then. And oh, yes. <laughs> I, appreciate, I appreciate them, though. I really do. And every once in a while, someone will say, hey, I found a typo on page 47 of Limitless. And I'm like, oh, have you found the second one yet? Because I know that there are two. And then I'm like, ha, ha, ha. And then they have to read my book like six times because they ah. have to find it. And that one is a harder one because it's just a there versus a there. And yeah. it's, yeah. you know it's not going to be caught with your eye unless you're really paying attention to it as opposed to the other one, which was inspiration. Oh yeah. <laughs> Somebody somehow put a K in inspiration, but maybe that's just a fancy tattoo. It gives you inspiration. Uh, I was going to yeah. say that uh, you, you see if the URL is available for that. I know, exactly. That's the name <laughs> of my next book. So John, this has been so delightful. I could talk to you all day long, but um, tell the fine people where they can find you. You can find uh, everything I've been doing for the last few decades. I think at uh, duct tape, marketing.com and that's d-u-c-t-t-a-p-e marketing.com fantastic you know i was raised by a father who taught me that there is no problem you cannot solve without with with a can of wd-40 and a roll of duct tape <laughs> so you know i'm and, all about duct tape marketing many, many people have i think that that obviously has been a measure of the success of using that metaphor is that a lot of people have a very fond um, affection for duct tape. I will say the only challenge with it though, is it doesn't translate to a lot of language or a lot of uh, other countries. Mm. So there are Portuguese and Spanish versions of my book out there uh, that say marketing that is low cost and effective. <laughs>
<laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, there's some selling points there. Listen, I, I had a search firm that I named the Nonprofit Professionals Advisory Group. So, you know, we were still successful, yeah, but I'm definitely not in marketing. <laughs> Thank you for your time today. You are lovely. This was so educational and inspirational. Well, thanks, Laura. It's always fun.